Oh, fantastic, everyone. So we've reached the end of the two days. This is the final panel. Um, so thank you, thank you all for uh, holding on to the forum. And we are welcoming uh, all our wonderful speakers from this day, all our wonderful presenters. And uh, we're going to start with uh, our first question, which is uh, uh, the analog and digital bit is how do we you all cope uh, with the teaching and the situation this year or the students with the Zoom, with the, you know, all your challenges and all your uh, discoveries and positive things. And yeah, so we'll take it from there. So, so whoever, wants, whoever wants to start. Mm -hmm. I can start if you Fantastic. like. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, my experience with the teaching online yeah, was that um, in, the, in the art school I'm teaching, uh, we used Teams. That was a given, basically. So that was the platform we were using. And uh, quickly, I decided to actually start uh, pre-recording my, uh, my teachings. I was normally going to do live in the class by uh, video. So what I did was I had digital presentations that I always prepare also when I meet my students in the classroom, because mostly I, I teach graphic design. And uh, mostly what I do is a, a general class opens with like, let's say 15 or 20 minutes of a bit of theory or insights to kind of start a uh, discussion with the students. And then later on, we, would, we will go to their personal work and either discuss it as a group or individually. So what I did, what the learning point was basically to uh, kind of make a compromised video of what I would normally say in front of the class. And what I learned was that that, uh, that worked quite well and now I'm still doing it while I'm teaching life the same way. Because what I noticed is that many students find it very practical to kind of have the possibility to jump back to what exactly was he saying again and they can have a, a moment to, uh, to re-see it once or sometimes even twice. So, so actually from that I've learned that I'm that a short, uh, compact, compact video with the, the talking topics and also the visuals I was planning to show, to share that with the students as a, mm. as a backup, basically, for them to go back to. Fantastic, fantastic. So, so also, also in Holland, there's quite a bit of uh, physical sort of one-to-one, -one, uh, correct? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 you mean uh, during the, the COVID time? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, our uh, our uh, university was closed for what was it uh, more oh. than the, uh, more than six months. Oh wow! So the last part of the of the last uh, academic year, we did not uh, see our students live at all. So they shut down for six months. Yeah, uh, for six months. Wow. And since since this academic year, we opened again. So now it is uh, the the classroom is divided over two rooms in order to keep enough distance. So so we did a full digital uh, half end of the year last academic year so that was a, a big wow. challenge yeah yeah that was like yeah. a, a national political decision right and yeah i don't was in in the uk the the university state open party or was no, it? no. Uh, but we have also from the uk yeah okay um yeah so well just um I, I work at Birmingham City University and we, we shut down in March. We were kind of looking at the rest of Europe thinking, when is this going to happen? Because it seems like everyone else went into this big lockdown and nothing was happening for us. But all of a sudden, as if overnight, it just went from everything's normal to everything was online. And for the last few weeks, well, a couple of months of the year that was left, it felt almost like, we were putting a plaster on the gushing wound. You know, we were um, we were trying to get by with the online teaching, but it was a world that we weren't used to at all. But I think since then, it's really forced us all to reevaluate our practice to some extent. Um, now, my colleagues from visual communication are teaching half half in the university and half online because our university has made a pledge for 50-50 even though it's quite hard to, you know, stick to a pledge for something that you're not in control of. But um, I've been working fully online uh, since the start of the year, since September. I don't teach practically though. So I teach contextual studies to students who are in graphic communication, illustration, photography and design for performance. 
And I've actually found this online environment to be quite transformative um, because I don't have to be there with them physically. Mm. I found mm. that this kind of chat space at the, at the side and having that constant interaction is really changing the whole feel of the sessions because it is becoming much more interactive. So it's, it's interesting just that you should say about recording sessions. I am recording them as I do them live, but I feel if I try to do them beforehand, it always feels a bit rusty. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm, do, I'm doing it to the best uh, possible way I can, but uh, of course I'm also not, I mean, I know that one of my colleagues uh, as a teacher is a, is an actor and I'm sure that she's doing a lot better than I'm doing because I'm also not a, a camera person. But uh, but I think what I do is I mostly have a lot of visuals. And so it's not just my head talking, but it's a lot of examples and visuals and uh, and sometimes quotes. So I try to, to kind of make it uh, engaging that way. Uh, but I'm also learning by doing basically. Fantastic. What we can call is a huge paradigm shift for both education, educators and the students, I think. Uh, in my country, my university was one of the first universities that closed, shut down the uh, system. And we were already uh, using these teams and other platforms for giving our lectures. But however, it was uh, such a surprise for us uh, with the ideological thinking of giving the lectures in the best way. It was not working. And for a couple of months, we were just struggling with the communication problems with the students and also uh, with each other as instructors. And uh, the way we try to build our contents, the way we are trying to convey our messages to the students was really uh, in a hard situation because uh, the students were not getting what we really want them to do. And uh, that's why uh, if you listen to my presentation, we were looking for such uh, an immersive model for like distance learning and using these XR technologies. And that's why we were trying to build up some new models uh, about what we have right now. Fantastic, excellent. Um, I wanted to add an observation, um, and I'm, I'm not a teacher um, in a university or anything, but I think well, I facilitate workshops. You give well, many workshops, yeah, so, it's, yeah, it's, so it's, it's, not, it's not different. It's a very similar yeah. principle, yeah. Um, but it's actually forced everyone to work a lot harder um, in terms of sort of people skills, because, you know, we've, we've like the technology is now a given, so that's not really seen as necessarily the the innovative thing and and also there's just the, such a scope of of skill sets when it comes to being fluent with technology some people have never really so you know i go into some sessions and they don't re they've never heard of a breakout room before versus some who are really really expectant that you will use lots of different ideas and new things bring lots of new things into the session so in some i'm um, you know, I'll alternate between using like flinger boards and murals and all these other new tools within within Zoom or or whichever platform, and versus you know really having to go back to basics with people. So like, I have to work a lot harder in terms of flexibility and adaptability to people's skill sets. I find, um, but then that we've we've managed to introduce some like new ideas because of that. So figuring out how to connect with an audience differently when you're not in the room with them so we will do things like send an audio recording the night before so people can become accustomed to your voice and have this little introduction before they meet you or we'll do sort of little um like surveys throughout the session so you can like you'll just pop a question in the chat and and then um use, using a sort of type form feedback loop they can answer questions throughout the session and then it all gets emailed to you after so you have this sort of like sense of stopping and reflecting so all these kind of like different things to play with because you don't have that human connection in a room anymore. You can't rely on it. So I found that to be really fun, actually, to, to try out all these different ways and, and make the people stuff the frontier of innovation rather than the technology. Hmm. Fantastic. I, I don't actually teach in terms of classes, so I'm mainly doing one-to-ones or portfolio surgeries or giving lectures in different countries. So giving lectures seems to be just as easy on Zoom as it does in real life, except it's much harder to get feedback in terms of 
reading the audience and reading body language. But um, I actually get more questions because I think they're less frightened of asking. Mm, that's interesting. That's interesting. Well, one of the uh, things that I found this year that that got a little bit side to the, was put to the side was the um, the student's voice, um, and I thought that a lot of the discussions happening on um, on education level uh, was neglecting the students. So I'm just wondering how can we make this uh, conversation, this process, uh, more student centered. Ask for students. <laughs> That's, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it, it just feels that the students are, are doing their best to cope. But at the same time, uh, we have actually changed their experience actually midterm last year. Yeah, So they've had to kind of pivot themselves. Uh, but how can we really help, 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 help them even more? I was actually quite interested in what Alex was saying about how these these new tools, it's not so much about the tech because it's not new, even if it is new to us. Um, it's more about that that people skills, that interaction. And I would actually say, Left Harris, that I and I can I can speak for all my colleagues as well. We we are trying to put the student at the center of it. And this has become a lot harder work, I think, for everyone. I don't mm really fully understand how, but everyone in my office, everybody's workload seems to have increased so much and we really are trying to go above and beyond. I would just say feedback, that yeah. reflective feedback but throughout. Maybe to, to, to refine this, for, for example, yeah, there's a kind of learning that happens when the class stops. Yeah? And for me, that's a very important learning. So when the students go away, five of them together, have a coffee or have a drink or have a chat. Yeah. That kind of learning, that kind of interaction. So we've only given them a very specific kind of interaction, an in-class interaction. And the out-of-class interaction and all the serendipitous interactions is stopped. Uh, and all the education experience is stopped. Uh, so that's what I'm saying, that we've com that we've had to sh shift the model, not because of because we wanted to, but anyway, we we've had to in, in, in the end. But, but they, they are receiving a very different experience, yeah? Through, through through the the, the framework that uh, has been created, so that kind of interaction, and, and how can we make that more sort of flip it around? So maybe. I think it is about the interaction. Sorry, sorry. Uh, it is all about the interaction to be built uh, upon the content that you provide. Mm. Uh, even if it's a theoretical or practical subject that you want to teach. Uh, you have to make the student active learners, not just the passive listeners to what you say. Even if it's a, a, an online uh, session or just a video that you upload to somewhere, you have to create the interaction uh, between the students also, each, each other, so they have to understand why they are doing this and uh, how they can achieve the results uh, with different ways, different methods. So you have to keep them active, uh, not just for a passive learner or passive listener just to make uh, their interaction with the content uh, with the things that uh, they make and of course for design education it's all practical actually so you have to find the tools the right tools and the uh, right perspectives to show uh, what is right or what is wrong and what is the improvement of uh, a design uh, process and the results so uh, it's all about uh, constructing these elements uh, within the education and the content. Otherwise, it will be just a video speech or something. Fantastic. I, I'm curious as to, to know what you mean by what you think you mean by student centered, because I mean, do you mean you're putting more attention and focus on them, or do you mean you're giving them more responsibility and ownership? No, world? no, it's, 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 the, it's trying to, to, to add things that have been taken away from, from this process. The kind of learning and teaching that's not just happening in a classroom environment, but all other kinds of learning as an educational experience. Mm -hmm. So we, we've changed educational experience yeah, into a place now where they do their shopping, they do their talking, they do their watching their videos, and they're also doing their education. Mm -hmm. So having having changed their education experience, yeah, how do we give some of that back into mm -hmm. them? But this seems really central to your ethos in general anyway, that learning should be experiential and it should be mm -hmm. 
something you and sort of what I tried to put in the video was, you know, that you 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 really learn by doing anyway. So Absolutely. that has to be built in, right? So why is it that everything is being done via a small screen? Like there should be accountability concepts built into the the learning that is about going out into the world and trying something like experimenting um that sort of thing i i don't know as i'm not a teacher but i have a similar parallel whereby um i'm working with a housing association that are trying to make all of their work more community and tenant focused mm -hmm, mm -hmm, we're just trying mm -hmm. to break down what that really means like does it because what i'm the feeling that i get a little bit is that they are by putting the focus on the tenants they're actually giving them kind of more work to do and it's a it's almost like more of a burden rather than um something that is useful to them no, like a, I, mean, <laughs> I mean i just find that they're, that they're running from class to class like headless chickens you know in a way it's a, or some class overlap or something you know and this experience of just being sh shaken around <laughs> digitally in a way you know mm -hmm. and so how we have to somehow make that framework more more more, more humane yeah. i believe this is uh, just a content customization mm -hmm. uh, each student has different talents and different potentials so uh not uh acting like every student is the same so of now course. there's a chance uh, th with the digital content you can recreate the uh maybe the the content itself to fit the students talents and abilities so that's why it's actually creating the content uh, at the very center of the uh, students mindset that's uh, mm -hmm. what i can say because mm -hmm uh the paradigm shift means this way you don't teach everything as the same way you are uh, contacting with the students it's not same okay so every student is different so you have to give a content which can uh, vary uh, with the talents of the students so your answer is it has to be personalized right that's what you're yes, saying exactly, exactly oh. okay and what what i really missed is uh being in the digital space uh, 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 and teaching hands-on design is uh, that students, they learn so much from each other, right? We are the teachers, but of course they learn as much from their neighboring uh, student or the people in their classroom as from, from us, the, the teachers. And that part is harder to uh, make happen online, I think. The way, the way I was trying to deal with that was to, uh, because you cannot, uh, if you teach for three hours, my classes are three hours, it's very hard for three hours to keep everyone focused and active because it's it's almost impossible actually. So what what I did was I was breaking up the class in groups of four, and I, I was talking to four students at the same time, and then trying to make them interact as well on their on each other's work. And, and we were all looking at the same visual, so we were all knowing what we were talking about. So that was kind of a way to. Yeah. compensate that missing interaction that normally takes place in the in a physical classroom but i'm i'm, I'm not sure if it's if it's an opt optimal uh, solution but it it was mm. the improvised solution basically mm. at that time mm. 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 that's very interesting so you've all presented some very strong uh, things today is there anything you would like to discuss uh, about each other's presentations or each other's work uh, or the, the the forum in general we can open up the discussion. Let's see if there are any questions as well. Can we also jump back to this morning's uh, to the bow breaking down the Bauhaus or not? Because yes, of, I, yes, of course. Because I, I thought uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, agreement, uh, although people use different words. I think in the discussion about uh, how to reinvent the future of education and how to make it adaptive, right? To to this this future of uh, design education that that no one can predict really because it is already hard to know what is happening in ten years with all these technological developments that can that will have an effect on everyone's profession and particularly also on design and, and also education. But the model that I thought was interesting uh, and was not mentioned is that model that uh, is called the 21st century skills. I don't know if you are all familiar with that, but I think that is a very valuable set of uh, uh, skills that not only designers can learn because it's not uh, exclusively uh, developed for designers, but it's overlapping for, let's say, 80% with what the design education generally looks like because it focuses on that creativity is important, so ideation, the quality that you can come up with valuable ideas. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and uh, critical thinking that I, in my view, that is also research that designers can do good research, mm -hmm. uh, collaboration skills so that they can work in groups, problem solving mentality, ICT literacy, so they have a knowledge of how to deal with the technological tools or can partly shape them themselves, communication skills and cultural awareness. I think that this, this is very, very valuable. And they call it 21st century skills, but it's, you could also call it 21st century education skills. I think there's a lot of uh, mileage in that, uh, personally. And, yes. and Sorry. Yeah, so in a way, it's, it's maybe a way to summarize the most important things that were said this morning, in my view, at least. So <laughs> that, uh, I can say more about it. I don't you please, I mean, I mean, sure. Yeah, because and, and the, what I what I personally think is that, and that's also what I said uh, in my uh, in my talk that I posted for the symposium is I think that ideation skills for designers in the future are very important because the production part will be automated for a substantial part because of uh, computing and artificial intelligence, uh, and I've been thinking over the years actually of how to teach uh, creativity because it's often something that comes by intuition or it's not never really formalized or, or put into words of how you do that. So that was the thing I was thinking of when I was teaching in China because I was teaching in China for five years and later on again in the Netherlands. And I formalized the uh, six uh, thinking methods of how you can stimulate creativity basically, how you can teach uh, young designers like students, but actually also more experienced ones. On, uh, with mindsets, they can learn and adapt to uh, to develop uh, creative or visual ideas with. Uh, and I, in my view, if designers are capable of doing that, they are very much uh, future resistant, basically. Mm. And that I wrote in the book. And so the book is uh, is uh, called How to Create Better Ideas. I'm curious what the other things of the other speakers think of what are important qualities for designers to uh, to have for to be ready for the future i'm curious a bit a little, a little bit about sort of the like decentralization of of um design um and that it sh that in the future i mean this is sort of a system-wide shift as a whole that you know manufacturing um like designs, like let's say take 3D printing and stuff, assuming that this stuff will scale and um, become more accessible and cheaper. And I've, I recently was talking to um, a, a sort of environmental entrepreneur who's doing a big R&D de development project with, um, to allow for sort of people to, to manufacture things with aluminium very, very cheaply and you, but using recycled um, like thrown away cans and stuff and, and putting them back into the systems so making it all circular. And that, that those those um, machines that would do that could be made available to people for about um, sort of five hundred pat to seven hundred pounds, and that so it would become affordable for lots and lots of communities and schools and whatever to be able to do this and do this manufacturing very very quickly. And so, yeah, I'm curious to know if that's something that you guys you're experiencing as practitioners and teachers, um, and whether and that seems to me that will profoundly affect people's ability to design. Um, and get their ideas like like seen and visible and, and tested by a lot more people very very quickly and easily. Yeah, that's I think that's a very much uh, scenario that will grow and become relevant and important in the future of design. That uh, that other communities can be uh, made part of uh, of uh, experiences like that. The uh, the that, uh, designer that I find very inspiring that is also exactly doing what you are describing is called Dave Huckers. He has started a Precious Plastic. Mm -hmm. And that's a, have you heard about it? It's a, so he's a, he's a product designer, but he thought, okay, I'm going to start a community uh, to try to see if I can solve the uh, plastic pollution worldwide. I mean, that's a super big ambition, of course, but what he did was very practical. He said, okay, I'm going to make blueprints of uh, three machines to uh, process plastic to shredder it, to melt it, and to put it into molds. And uh, he he offers them for free online and people uh, can download them. They can build them these machines wherever they are in the world. 
And now he has a community of 40,000 people that have their own uh, business mm-hmm. sometimes, right? They make money with it. And at the same time, they clean their city or their neighborhood by collecting plastic, learning what types of plastic there are. And that way, he, uh, yeah, he provided a platform for people to, uh, to or survive in uh, just economically. But also, there's, uh, so it's e- it has economic value. It has social value because of the fact that people are starting to collaborate together as a community. They start to collect plastic together and start to process it. And it is an environmental value because we end up with cleaner streets or neighborhoods. So it's a super exciting example of how you can uh, mobilize communities and make them involved in uh, improving uh, the climate around uh, the place you live, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. That really reminds me, um, both of what you've just said, of, um, you know, do you know the art and design uh, collective Assemble, who won the Turner Prize a few years back and who were notoriously difficult to define as to whether they're architects, um, artists, designers, and don't really want to be defined. But the project that they won the Turner Prize with was... um, they, they took over an area of this, this kind of rundown street in Liverpool and did a few different really community focused projects there. They renovated some of the buildings that were due to be demolished and it was a very much community driven thing. They set up a social enterprise where the community are now making pottery from the recycled waste construction materials and it is as you say it's really circular i think we need to embrace that culture of of kindness as cheesy as it sounds and of sharing um as you both just said things with an environmental and a social cause at heart and that have the ability to kind of glue us back together a little bit more um i think lockdown has made us all realize the importance of things a little bit more we've maybe reevaluated our perspectives and certainly for me I feel that creativity in general um, and the natural world have taken on this heightened sense of importance so I think you know we need to just do whatever we can to drive that on but I was just thinking about that notion of art creativity being so important on every level especially during lockdown We saw loads of initiatives. I'm sure Phil and Alex, you will have seen Grayson's Art Club on Channel 4 that went on throughout, you know, the first lockdown. But how, this is a sort of secondary question really, but how do we confront that idea with the fact that in the UK, the creative subjects are being squeezed out of of the school children before they even get to higher education? Um, That's quite a challenge, I think, looking towards the future of design education. And I think we really do need to increase our engagement with those younger children if we are to see that that flourishing future. Yeah, I don't think that's an exclusive thing that happens in the UK, that kids are educated out of creativity because it happens in many places, I think. Mm -hmm. I was very inspired by what Penny Hay uh, showed this afternoon, the first uh, speaker because she really focuses on these younger kids, right? To make them really active in uh, creative processes. And I think, I mean, that's, you have to keep keep uh, feeding it basically to keep it alive, right? So I, I thought it was very inspiring. It was, that there's a thing uh, that maybe uh, could be uh, a focal point for educators in designing creativity, I think. And that is that because the demands of the of the world around us are changing so much and the existing uh, economic systems have to be uh, rethought. I think designers also have to be very much encouraged to not wait any longer for uh, clients, the traditional clients to to come to them and ask them, can you please help me to solve this or that problem? But they have to set their own agenda and start to think up their own projects because if you want to make uh, solutions for a world that are more sustainable or more inclusive. Traditional companies or organizations are not so likely to do that. And if they want it, they have to go to a transformation. Why not just start it yourself is what I always try to encourage with my students. You can think up your own business or project or whatever you call it. 
and just start to uh, to uh, to do it grassroots yourself. So don't wait for clients anymore. Just uh, be your own client or create your own place where you can collect money for your uh, public support or whatever. There's many ways of, of doing that. But I think that is something that needs to be encouraged very much. We used to have some very interesting ways of collecting money in the East End of London, which which I don't think are really much good for art students. So. They don't work. No. They're too and violent. <laughs> They're too <laughs> violent. <laughs> too violent. <laughs> okay. I wonder if going back to your to, the, to your question about education, um, the way that I would suggest it is that we we need to stop seeing ourselves as in these categories anyway. Um, and I was at a conference last year where um, they tried to make an attempt to sort of break down silos around solving problems, like for you know the future world. And the the um, what they did was they said, okay, we're going to talk about, you know, health, technology, et cetera, on all these different tables, but we're going to have an artist on every table. And I think that they, they kind of thought that that would be like, that was a really quite progressive idea to like make sure that there was an artist or creative person there, but it actually didn't work. And I think the reason it didn't work was because that person just saw themselves as an artist and nothing else. And that's not the reality of who we are. Like pretty sure all of you guys do your finances fine. Like it's, you know, so you might feel you're, you're better and, or your primary skill set is somewhere, but if we start to think of ourselves as a bit more intersectional and not, and I think that will help ed educators not have to like categorize everything all the time and go, you know, we've got to, we've got to cut out art because we need more time for science, but everybody ultimately needs a blend of all those things. And, you know, I can think I put in my little video was that creativity is the top empl employability skill, like soft skill that, that, that people want. So, it makes absolutely zero sense, but I think it's because we we just re relegate it to the arts and, and cultural design subjects as if it's not something you have in science. <laughs> I mean, that's madness. That's so just breaking down those under that understanding would be a starting point. In a way, you know, they say they want creative, but do they? Because, because if they want creative, then you have the end of managerialism, the end of bureaucracy, the end of structures. And I don't think a lot of people want that. I think they, they profess to claim to want creativity, but if they really get creativity, uh, that would uh, convert a lot of the existing structures right now. They want creativity, but not chaos, I think, sometimes. Oh. But, but I, also, I also think you get more creativity when you stop getting students to do their research by computer. Hmm. Uh, because if you put in dog into a Mac, you get hundreds of pictures of a dog. But if you go to a library and look through books for dogs, you see thousands of irrelevant images. And it's for normally the irrelevant images which give you the ideas. And, and I think part of creativity is the idiosyncratic way the brain links different things together, which come from very different places than following direct links from a computer to look at the word dog and see lots of dogs. And it's that odd oddity you get from from absorbing things you don't know you need or can't see any relevance to, which puts together the sponge of that creative ideas. Mm. Absolutely. Mm, okay. Serendipity, right? Yeah. What what I sometimes do with my students if they are stuck, right? If they think like, I don't know, I don't know how to progress, and if logic doesn't work, then I tell them, and that's what actually what I learned from an intern, funny enough, uh, because she was producing a lot of visual work and I got a bit annoyed, like, what is the aim of this or why do you do this? And then later on, she she uh, had a fantastic output with ideas that I, I could not imagine. And then I thought, wow, this is fantastic. You first produce many visuals and then you start to look at it with an analytical uh, analytical eye and start to make a selection and that way you can kind of inspire yourself almost so without a purpose you produce or you collect visuals and then you start to inspire yourself that's another way of thinking it's actually first uh, doing and then thinking and that is a very liberating way of uh, of loosening up yourself or a group of people that have to kind of come up with ideas because we all think it has to be every step has to be uh, justified and we have to explain we are making the next step because of this all fine and it also can work but it can also not work and there's different ways of doing that so I think that's a quite a I always get very happy when we do that because all of a sudden you feel that the whole atmosphere is kind of becoming more loose and more experimental basically 
I think if you go back to a kid which can pick up a pencil and turn it into a sword or a magic wand or... Exactly. Could, yeah. when, a, when you're a child, you don't worry. And yeah. I think half the students worry about being graphic designers. And really what you've got to do is teach them to play again, to, to go back not worry about what they're doing, just play and through the play and making and looking and using their bodies, yeah. then they begin to learn and they begin to come up with different solutions. Exactly. No, no, no hesitation, right? Like a, yeah, like a childlike uh, freedom. That's sometimes it's really hard to kind of re uh, reinvent it as a, as a grown up. And that's exactly also what uh, I think earlier on that, that was referred to in one of the talks by Ken Robinson that also says this, that, it's really hard to uh, to maintain and actually power with customers. Also. It's hard to maintain. Uh, everyone is born an artist, but it's hard, uh, very hard to stay one while growing up. It's very much true. And sometimes it's good to kind of force yourself back into that uh, non-judgmental way of just making and afterwards rationalizing. Yeah, I never, I never grew up. I just stayed a child. It's much more fun. <laughs> Grown ups, from what I could see, you got caught up in so many bloody problems. I think being a kid and playing is much, much more fun. Exactly. <laughs> People have got a long way to go to be like you, though, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You turn the brain off, just use the body. It's much easier. Use your heart and brain, body, not your brain. But I do think, from a pra like from a practical point of view, and especially talking about like the way that we're having to work now, actually, if you want to get into that play state, that, that kind of state of no responsibility or whatever it is, childlike, that you need um, not to, because what I'm finding is I'm having to switch all the time between different sort of like almost mindsets, you know, going into a, doing a really creative session with people versus doing some, doing other tasks that are more practical or, and actually siphoning off a whole day that this is just a play day. This is just a, um, like a totally like experimenting doing day rather than a then I have to go and like get into like a, a whole inbox of messages and respond to them on that day just actually compartmentalizing it and just almost like designing your your schedule differently I think that's that's been quite I've tried to do it a little bit but not totally successfully <laughs> uh, it, it is a good idea because I also know because I've also worked for bigger design firms and the bigger organizations get the more formalized they get even if they are creative agencies you cannot escape really but there are agencies that decide okay 20 percent of our week of, of everyone's week you can decide to work on your personal interest and explore and go and find stuff that you think is interesting the only condition is it's it's not uh, that you just do whatever you want or do your own what, uh, bookkeeping or whatever i don't know it's they have to uh, discover something they find interesting and later on share it with the others so that's mm. the only the only condition. But people can then explore new ways or new 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 topics that they find interesting and also uh, uh, inspire each other by doing that. It's, I think it's for maybe for every company, but particularly for creative agencies, it's a very uh, solid idea actually because it might feel like we are wasting time here, but actually you are gaining a lot more uh, richness in ideas and experimentation and and trying out new things. And if you are talking about innovation or innovative companies or trying to make companies more innovative, this might be a way to do that, I think. Give people playing time. Great. Fantastic. So if anyone else has nothing to add, we can uh, close the forum here. Thank you so much, everyone, for your fantastic contributions. Uh, from Monday, we'll be already working on Design Education Forum 2021. So please keep an eye on uh, you know, any ideas and any contributions. So we can take, it takes about a year to organize the event. It, it, it really uh, does. I've got an idea. T take a week off. But... <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> no, absolutely. But you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, to give the uh, you know, how long it takes to, to get this together. Uh, so fantastic. Thank you again. For uh, fantastic contributions, and uh, we'll be in touch. Yeah, thank you, Lefter, thank you. for organizing this. Yes, thank you, Lefter. Yeah, great, you, great work. It's such a great event, and we get so much inspirations from all the speeches and all the people just joined together. 
and I will I think uh, next year it will be like face to face communication with each yes. other and, and dinners. <laughs> yes, thank and you. And lunches. <laughs> Fantastic, fantastic. And, uh, Ali, did you know I'm visiting professor at Birmingham City <laughs> University in typography? I do indeed. For... Oh, you did? Oh, right. Okay. I've never met anyone who knew. <laughs> That's a bit of a small world, isn't it? Yeah, design's a very small world. Yes. <laughs> fantastic. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Have a fantastic Bye. day. All the best. Bye. 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 Bye.